Welcome to Karate 360. I'm one of the co-hosts, Richard Mosdell. I'm the other host, Kaylin Angloss. Welcome to another fantastic show. We are at episode 87, and today you're going to hear about some of the top WKF athletes. You're going to hear about what it means to be a showdown, a first degree black belt. You're going to find out how sprint training can enhance every part of your karate, every part of your fiber. And we're going to go over some of the upcoming events that are coming up. So let's get on with the... Karate 360, let's start the show. You will kick high and I will sweep low. From local to global, it's the thing that we love. Karate! San Rokumaru! Richard Sensei. Hi! Hi! What does it mean to be a karateka? A karateka. To you, what does it mean to be a karateka? I have a, there's a reason I'm asking, but I want to hear what your answer first. Uh, it's funny you brought this up because I had this like on um, a vlog mm, okay. uh, a while ago. But uh, a karateka is someone, not only are they in the journey for themselves, but they're in the journey for their tribe. Deep. Right? Like if you, yeah. if you don't show up, how are you going to help the other people who want to train? Sure. Right? So a karateka for me is a little bit more than just, like as an athlete, you got to be a bit selfish mm -hmm. and pick and choose where you want to go. And sometimes, of course, being loyal to, loyal to something is good because you might get more long-term benefit out of it. You know, your coach might think more of you or do more of you. But I think a karateka is a little bit more broad than the idea of an athlete. So you think a karateka is different than an athlete? Yes. Is a karateka different than a teammate? That's a really good... That's really interesting. Because that's... Yeah. How, so the reason I'm asking you this question is I went to the store the other day to yes. to 7-Eleven mm -hmm. to buy ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> Good gesture. I'm with you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, I go up to the... Don't judge me, by the way. Girlfriend wanted ice cream. You get her ice cream. Oh, went I, up to, I love ice cream. Uh, that's <laughs> no problem. Me too. <laughs> uh, went up to the counter to pay, and I was wearing um, my Canada Open okay. shirt that you bought me from the Canada Open here this year. And the lady behind the counter obviously noticed it, and she goes... Are you a karateka? Which threw me off right away. Yes. I, was like, I was like, yes. Like nobody yeah, ever yeah. asks it like that, yeah. right? Are you a karateka? And she was like, oh, yes, very good. And she goes, how would you describe being a karateka? And I was like, that's a good question. Ah. I was like, I'm going to ask Richard. And I said, I said, you know, it's kind of like being a teammate. Like you're For more sure. than just you're more than just somebody that's participating in karate. It's more than just your participation. Mm. You're a teammate you're embodying the traditional aspect of karate and i was kind of struggling with my words and i thought well is karateka like is being a karateka like being a teammate and i think there's something there but i like how you say it's different than being an athlete because i agree athletes have to be very selfish you have mm -hmm. to be very selfish by nature to be especially a high performance athlete um but yeah i think karatekas for me are teammates and, and almost like karate family and totally. karate tradition you know yeah, what I yeah. mean yeah there's more sense of a tribe when you're a karateka yeah you're for part sure. of a journey you're part of a legacy too yes yeah i mean i really try and avoid the cult aspects of a karate yeah um but there is something like you're carrying on a legacy now obviously as an athlete you can be really loyal to your team and your coach that mm. is totally possible and i when people say oh you know karate means it's much deeper in terms of your emotional connection I think sometimes people can be on a sports team and have a very strong emotional sure, connection. For 100%, sure, 100%. Yeah. But Karateka is, I think, is a little more broad. And a, there's a bit of a sense that you're going to carry the tradition on. I yeah. think in some big sporting, like, you know, soccer clubs and stuff, um, there is a sense that we have to carry the tradition on or rugby clubs. Sure. I asked this question around to other people in other martial arts. Mm -hmm. And somebody from jiu-jitsu that used to train jiu-jitsu gave me a really good definition of, of being like a true judo ju uh, like a jiu-jitsu athlete yep. kind of like a judoka and judo and that kind of thing is that you're a student of the game is totally. that you're a student of the sport that you're actually in it you're learning you're, you're you're teaching you're learning you're understanding better you have that physical and that emotional connection you're a student totally. of the whole entire game that's what i think about too like when i say you you're carrying on a legacy so you're going to learn more you're going to study the history yeah you're going to try and reach out more. I mean, teaching is so much part of learning. Mm -hmm, 100%. Right? So, you know, I had yellow belts uh, 
yellow belt adult and a blue belt junior helped me teach the juniors class today. Nice. And they were like, this is amazing. I can't believe I actually get to teach people. Yeah. Like, you just learned it. I got to pass it on. Yeah. So it was fun. But it, it is definitely a good way to learn. Like, it, the gr- it's one of the best ways, in my opinion, for some mm-hmm. people to learn is, is, is to teach, really. Yeah, yeah. And be prepared and what you're going to say and stuff. Yeah, for sure. For sure. No, I just wanted to get your take on that because, again, like we discussed last week, you've kind of been through the cruddy world so i wanted to get your take on the uh, on that so no that's good and i think it means different things to different people 100 percent with but everything karateka, i mean judoka person of the way yeah Aikyoka, mm-hmm. that sort of thing um because in japanese athlete means senshu right like and they'll actually say like you know suzuki senshu is up at bat now you know he's, okay um but karateka is like okay this is happening now when you're competing in a karate tournament you are a senshu yes Right, but when you're a person in the dojo, you're a karate cut, or even they use the word memba. Memba, <laughs> karate yeah. memba, or karate do karate, uh, dojo kaiyin. Kaiyin means like member of the group. Sure, sure. Yeah. But it's, now, I think it's important. Do you think there's anything in this that's like rooted in like Japanese tradition? Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. there's a reason I asked. Did you, first of all, have you did you watch any of the World Cup? I have did actually. Watch I watched the. Um, I watched the, the game with Japan when they lost like the last ten seconds. Okay, yeah, that was a great like that was a great game. Sure, that was yeah, exciting. I'm uh, same thing. I'm not a football, uh, yes. soccer as we call it in Canada, North America, uh, fan really at all. Yeah, but it's exciting like watching all these nations come for together, sure, to sure. come together and play. But the reason why I asked if it was rooted in in Japanese tradition, I don't know if you saw this, but at the World Cup. The there was pictures that circulated from teams' locker rooms, and yes. they were just a complete mess. All the locker rooms were a complete mess. Like people just the team just left them in shambles, garbage everywhere, just left things. Mm. The Japanese team uh, change room, like immaculately yeah, spotless. Yeah, like yeah. it looked better than it probably looked like when they first got there. Like it was shining. That's it awesome. was so clean. Um, so I just thought like that's probably like that's just Japan, right? Like that's just that's a that's a big mm, cuz I know they did it at the world championships too, right? Yeah, yeah. It's become a big thing for Japanese people Japanese teams overseas mm. to represent Japan well. Yes, okay. Right? Especially when they're getting government money to travel. Sure. You can go into some unbelievably terribly never put ba- uh, cleaned locker rooms in Japan. Okay. They exist. I'm sure they do. They totally exist. They, yeah. If the kids are everywhere. cleaning them and they're just whatever, we're just going to leave it dirty. Sure. But um, it's a really cool, it's soft power. It's a nice little branding. Right. That not only did you allow us to compete, but we, you know, they they do it a lot, not only for the host nation, they know they're going to get some publicity from it, but they do it also for all the viewers at home. Okay. Right. They say, look, we will. This overseas. is what we do. This is how, this is how you, Conduct yourself. Conduct like yourself, and yeah. they want a good reputation. Sure, you know? sure. I remember once when um, it, it was the Japan National High School Championships, like 2005, 2006, or maybe earlier than that, in uh, Chiba Prefecture. And there's these two. This for karate. Karate, yeah, yeah. karate. These two boys teams. Are, it's it is the nationals. They are competing against each other, and it's team kata. Okay. So they, it's they have their team jackets and they take them off, right? And they're both on either side of the ring. And one side folds up the jackets mm. just perfectly and lines them like one, two, three. Yeah, the other side just tosses them down. Yeah. And the people in the stands are like, that team's going to lose. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have that group mentality, you know? Yeah. Well, I remember funny. seeing even pictures from the 2016 World Championships of members of the Japanese team cleaning the facility that it was yeah, at. Yeah, and, and, and uh, supporters and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So, I yeah. mean... It's 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 in the tradition. It's so in the tradition. So you know, clean your dojo, keep it clean, help your sensei. Speaking of uh, the the World Cup, just one last thing on here. I I just saw this. The World Cup, this year's World Cup, is the number one viewed event of all time. Holy cow! It's three point five billion views or something like that. Wow! It's, it's, it's viewers, and uh, I think second was the Rio Olympics was right behind it, and then like a Super Bowl or something and, was and behind it, that. Probably with everyone on their phones and sure easy access to yeah. the internet and. and this is not a soccer podcast or a football yes. podcast, but I guess the quality from what I hear of these matches have been quite high too. So. For sure. Well, I remember being in Japan because the last place when I was teaching, you know, they had a, a big soccer program and one of the directors like, just think in triangles because mm. everything they're going to move, they're going to move it in a triangle so they can get around people. Right. And everything's like, okay, I'm going to think in triangles. I can now watch soccer games and go, and oh, just, okay. He's going there. He's, he's going, going there. there. <laughs> it's a triangle. You know, that's it's funny. Like spinning around. It's really cool. That's awesome. Um, yeah, it that's pretty neat. So, uh, 
I think the other thing that soccer's done, which karate is maybe getting better at, is it's not about trying to get new eyeballs. It's just trying to activate the karate world eyeballs. Sure, yeah. You just want the ones that are in your world. Yeah, yeah. Like if we if we don't have a good if we don't have good media, like look how good MMA has done. For sure, because of the production. They have a lot stronger. And you look at the production of like the karate combat league, the full contact mm-hmm. league, it's quite high production and it's getting a lot of buzz because of the high exactly. production value. Until they find out how much Bitcoin now actually <laughs> Yeah. Worth. Oh wait. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just looking on here. We got a question uh, sent to our Facebook page. Hey that I was gonna I, I, I told Pierre, who was the one who sent it to us, that we would answer. So Pierre. I'll f- Find it, Pierre Lane. I will okay. find it here in a second once I can figure out how to work this. But why why don't we, why, while you look for it, let's talk about some things that are going to happen in the next like 24 hours. 24 hours. All right. Yes. Well, okay. By the time. And then after that, that by the, the time the this comes out. Months. Yeah. By the time <laughs> this comes out. So in the next 24 hours, uh, we'll talk about it next week. But happening from tomorrow, we have the Wadokai World Kata Men's Champion who won tw- two times. Takuya Furuhashi Sensei. He has been uh, teaching in Eastern Canada. He's been teaching in Vancouver the last three days. He's coming to Kenzen Friday, Saturday, Sunday. He's going to teach tomorrow night. Awesome. So yep. next week we will uh, we'll talk We're about it. We're going to talk about sure. it. Um, and here's a really interesting thing. Uh, people have been sending me emails. And this is from people who, like, they don't write comments or send me comments very... Like, I've never received comments from these people or anything or they've interacted with me. Sure, sure. And... They're like, this is the best seminar I've ever attended in my like 30 years of martial arts. That's what they said. Yeah. Just wow. this guy is so nice and humble and funny and talented and, and knowledgeable. Yeah. It's been really amazing just to hear the comments coming. So, um, so that's really cool. And then we have confirmed that the WKF World Kata Champion, Men's Kata Champion from 2002, his name is... Takashi Katada. Katada, yes. Katada we talked about this last week. Right? He is definitely, definitely, definitely coming. 100% he's 100% in. 100%. He's on, coming. He bought his ticket. Katada August. coming. He's going to have a seminar here August 11th and 12th. This is a high performance kata seminar on how to actually any style. He's going to teach you how to get more power and speed in your kata. He's awesome. Gonna give feedback. Great. He's going to go through eight uh, Shiteru and Okinawan katas. And uh, then we're now going to do a seminar in Vancouver on August 14th. That's awesome. So it's good for a- so athletes and it's good for officials and instructors. Absolutely. And like you mentioned before, it's not very often, if ever, that we've had a, a world champion come to Canada. This, this is so funny. Like I've been telling, I think maybe I said it last week, like they never come here. Now yeah. I'm like, okay, they're coming twice. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> they're here. They're here. All right. So there, that's what's coming up. Now, we did get a fan question, fan Yay. question sent to us on our Facebook page. If you guys have any karate related or not, whatever, any questions, send them our way and uh, we will absolutely answer them here on the show. So we got a p- question here from pierre Elaine Chabot. Pierre from uh, Quebec sent a few questions, but we're just going to answer one of these here. So he wants to know. So he says, Pierre says, I'm Shotokan, basically, yeah. but I'm open to other styles as well as us on the show. Mm-hmm. The more I practice, he says, the less I feel attached to my Shotokan style. Okay. My question is, can I compete in karate with little variations in kata to the Shotokan kata, or do I need to conform exactly as one of my main styles? For example, he says, in Hinan Yonden, I prefer doing a side kick. Oh, oh sorry. I pushed the button. I prefer doing a side kick as in Wado instead of the classical Yoko Gary uh, kick. Mm-hmm. The reason is that I found it more practical when it comes to Bunkai Kumite. Will I be, quote unquote, disqualified? Uh, instantly with this variation in the WKF competition. Which kata was it? Uh, Hinan Yondan he was talking about. First, you don't want to compete in WKF competition with Hinan Yondan. Sure. I think he was just using that as an example. Yeah. But a good question. It's a great question. Yeah. So uh, if you get up there and you say Hinan Yondan, the judges are going to be looking for uh, something along a standard. Sure. Now, he's in Quebec, in the province of Quebec in Canada. Um there is some leeway now that they allow in how your school performs a kata. Sure. And like, if you look sharp and the other person doesn't look sharp at all, they might let, let it go. But there is a movement now in NONBC and it might come in other provinces where if the referees see too much variation, they don't know what to judge. Mm, yes, okay. Right? So there's a movement in BC where they're going to start standardizing 
the the lower level katas. Okay. So if you say go up and go, I'm gonna do Heian Yandan, then mm. they're gonna be looking for pretty much a bang on Shotokan version of Heian Yandan. Right. Um, but it's a good question. Can you put some variety, or or can you? Uh, Basically, does it do, does he have to conform? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's a really good question. It really, it depends on the community he's in. So he has to find mm-hmm. out from the chief, you know, one of the chief officials in Karate Quebec. And Quebec is strong with lots of Shotokan. Mm-hmm. If he goes up and does a non-standard move in a very popular Shotokan kata, will it be seen that he's not conforming to the kata? Sure. Or will he be seen as conforming to his school? Now, if he's sharp in all his movements, his basics are good, his fundamentals are good, they might let him go. Sure. You know, when you look at some of the senior WKF competitors and they compete in Shotokan and they do the sidekick in like... Um, I'm trying to think now, maybe Kankudai, and they just go like kick over the head height and lock it out. Mm. That was never there. They just embellished it okay. for competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a good question. Find out first, talk to some of the chief officials, see if it'll fly, and make sure your fundamentals are there. Sure. You aren't gonna be you're not gonna be sunk if you change one or two moves as long as you it's you know, if it's supposed to be left leg, left arm, you use left leg, left arm. You're not going to be sunk, but if you like, you're supposed to turn left, but you turn right. That's a problem. That's a problem. But that's a, that's a, that's a different thing, yeah. uh, for sure. Yeah, I think I I agree with everything you just said, and I think at some point, especially if you start to get a little bit more advanced in kata, you start mm-hmm. to go up to the ranks. There is a point where you do have to conform to what the yeah. judging want because we're we're judging you against a, a scale and that scale is often against the world champions who's doing it the mm-hmm. best. They're obviously doing it the best. So they're getting, they're getting judged uh, the best. So at some point there is going to be some kind of conformity to how the judges want to see it. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think at, at other levels you can, you can get away with it a little you bit. Know, and simply like videotape yourself doing the kata, look at the karate Quebec website, find out who the chief official is of yeah. the officials committee, Send it to him. email him and him or her and go, what do you think? Can I get away with this in the karate Quebec community? Yeah. And, uh, you know, they might be like, you can get away with it, but you got to do a nicer sidekick. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> or something. Or not. Yeah, yeah. Great question. Yeah, that's a great question, Pierre. Keep them coming. Absolutely. And same with you guys. You can send your questions on our karate360podcast.com, karate360podcast on Facebook. All right. We are going to move on now to a little bit of cruddy global news, but not really cruddy global news. More so what we want to talk about because it's a little bit of a lull in the action. There's a lull in the action of karate. We wanted to highlight just a couple WKF athletes that we, that are our favorites, yours, Richard Mosdell's, and my favorite, yes. some of our favorite fighters, some of our favorite kata athletes, and just kind of go over a few things. So I am going to pick here first. I'm going to pick... You know, it'd be easy to sit here and pick the Rafael Gaevs of the world. You know, everybody kind of likes Rafael. Yep. But one athlete that I wanted to pick in the minus 75 male Kumite division, he's still a famous name, but maybe not uh, quite as high up there as some of the other ones, is Captain America, Tom Scott. There we go. I'm a big fan of the way Tom Scott fights. I'm also a big fan of just Tom Scott in general. His personality, the way he holds himself, win or lose, when you see him in interviews, you know, I, I just think he embodies a Kratika. I think Ooh. you look at him and he and you see seems like a Kratika. So Tom Scott in the minus 75 kilogram division is one of my favorite athletes. Recently on the uh, WKF stage at the Pan American Championships, he won in the minus 75 mm-hmm. kilograms, Tom Scott. He got gold, gold medal. So he's sitting up there. I think he's sixth in the minus 75 kilogram division in WKF ranking. Okay. So he's working his way up. Uh, earlier this year, he got a third place at K1 Rabat. He also has gotten a top 10 in Rotterdam as well, so gaining points in those ones. And then he got a few participation. But Tom Scott, who's been coming up the ranks, uh, he is my one of my favorite athletes. So what, what do you like about the way he performs his technique? I like the way he moves and the way he sets. He very clearly sets up his athletes, mm-hmm. puts mm-hmm. them in a position where he wants them to be, and then capitalizes on that. So he's not just technically good, but he's also tactically and I think when you look at Tom Scott's fights, when he's in there, it looks like he has a game plan. He probably does have a plan of some sort, as most good fighters do, but it looks like he's executing a game plan. He's not just in there throwing techniques. He's got a game plan. He's trying to set you up, and he's he's firing in. That's what I really like about him. And nice guy. And nice guy. You see him lose. He doesn't, like, crash his 100%. 100%. So he's uh, he's one of my favorites. So what? Anyways, there's one. What do you got? 
I'm going to go back. Wayne Otto. Wayne Otto. You're going back. I'm going back. Whoa. Wayne Otto. Okay. What do they call him? The Black Panther. The Wow. What's okay. That? So Wayne Otto uh, is from England. Multiple. I don't even think he's on the WCF ranking because we're going back. We're going back. We're going back. I think he probably stopped competing in the mid-1990s. Uh, but look him up on YouTube. Wayne Otto. Fast. Mm. Tactical. Long reach. Amazing takedowns. Really, you know, tough mental strength. Sure. I think in the, no, let's see, maybe 1996 World Championships. Wow, going way back. <laughs> in Sun City, South Africa. <laughs> okay. Okay. He won because the other competitor fouled out and he started crying. He's like, I didn't want to win my world title like this. Oh. Like, I didn't want to win with it. He, he, he wanted was, to win He was yet. bashed up too. Whoa. Right? He's like, I didn't want to win my world title by the uh, other guy, guy fouling yeah. out. I wanted to win on my skill. Sure. You know? I get that. Um, he put out this really great training tape. So there was highlights of him competing. This mm. is back when, like, you wore a white belt and a white gloves, even though you're black belt, and the other person would wear a red belt and, and white, white gloves, gloves right? yeah. Just amazing foot sweeps. Really good at, like, faking low and going high. All right. And I always think of, like, his elbows and knees and everything were, were really agile, so he could be bending and twisting at different angles. All right. You know? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, look Otto. up Wayne Otto. He's exciting, exciting to watch. It's, f it's funny you mentioned uh, training videos, because uh, now that... You know, I wasn't thinking when we originally did this about about older athletes or yep. athletes who previously competed, but there was an athlete that really got me on the path of like karate strength and conditioning because he used to always put out videos of him training and he was always doing like plyometric drills sure. and jumping and he was the first one I said, you know, tuned up to some, yeah. some Metallica music and all that kind of stuff. His name was David Dubo. Do you remember David, David Dubo. Dubo? Sounds familiar. Yeah, he competed probably up till about five what, years what ago. Country? Uh, David Dubo, I think Croatia, maybe okay, okay. I can't remember exactly where he's from, but I do remember seeing videos of him, um, on there. And, I, and then also he's got a lot of obviously fights videos as well. I'm just looking up his name here. David Dubo. Yeah. David Dubo. Uh, oh, a little bit shorter, right? Yes, that's right. That's Short, right. bald. Is he Turkey or... I'm or just Greece looking at it here. Chile. Chile. Chile that's it. That's Chile, it. Chilean yeah. uh, athlete. David I think Dubo. I remember watching those videos, like him lifting weights, yeah, arriving yeah. on a motorcycle. Yes, that's like that. right. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. I had, yeah. I had those bookmarked too. Yeah. So back in the day, he was, he was probably uh, one of my favorites as well. One of my favorite fe female athletes right now who's really coming up, and I like her because she's been climbing the ranks like your name just keeps coming up and she's starting to build a little bit of a reputation yep. is Sarah Cardin from Italy ah. so she I like to watch her fight because she's so fast and technical but again she's like very even keeled she's moving up the ranks uh, let's see at, at the K1 Premier League in Istanbul. She got first place here just recently this year at the EKF Senior Championships. She got third. She got first place in Dubai last year. So, or sorry, this year. So Sarah Cardin's slowly been building it up. If you look at her WKF stuff, a lot of it's like participation, ninth place, fifth place. But then all of a sudden, she starts getting some third places, some second places, first places. So, I kind of like the the stories of the athletes building themselves up and climbing the ranks. Absolutely. So Sarah Cardin from Italy uh, in the minus 55 kilogram division is one of my favorites as well to watch. That's awesome. You got one more for us, Richard? I do. And um, actually, I, I'm trying to choose um, a Japanese female athlete because there's so many strong ones right sure. now. Strong ones. But as I was going through the list, I'm sorry, girls. Uh, I picked Ken Nishimura, just clicked on him because <laughs> I know his dad. Okay. Right? Seiji Nishimura, who's obviously was a famous athlete and stuff. Um, I was just couldn't decide which which of the female athletes I was going to choose, and I clicked on him. Um, so he is an exciting athlete, Ken Nishimura. He's from Fukuoka. Yes. Right? Uh, just won. Did he won the Pan Ams? Just won Rotterdam. Rotterdam, okay. He won Paris. Okay, yeah. Minus 75. Uh, he won Hamburg last year, and of course he didn't win the Pan Ams. Yes, uh, and um, <laughs> let's see, he has he hasn't won at the world level yet, but he's exciting because um, he has beat Agiev. That's right, right? Yeah, very yeah, very yeah. closely. Yeah. Um, so someone, I think he's really coming up in the rankings. Uh, especially because he's getting, he's been getting a lot of second and first place. He's getting a lot year. of points. Sorry to cut you off, but a lot of points recently. Like yes. you can see his point 
pool total has been going up quite fast. So keep an eye on Ken Nishimura. No, so that I think it's going to be uh, yeah a really exciting athlete to see as we come along. Um, okay, next podcast I'm going to pick some. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you about some Japanese female athletes. Yeah, we'll go from there. And you guys, let us know who your favorite WKF exactly. athletes are. We want to hear from you. Who are your favorite WK athletes? Why and uh, what do you like about them? Let us know. Karate 360 Podcast. All right, uh, let's go on to a little bit of technical tactical. Richard, what do you got? Okay, well, this weekend we're going to have a black belt test. A bl- oh, that's, yeah, that's right. right. Owen, big Owen. Is that's right. The black and belt by test. the way, shout out, big Owens, 19th birthday. Boom. 19, happy happy, birthday, happy big birthday, big, guy. big Owen. Yes. And that's a big deal in Canada. It's a big deal. Because 19 is legal drinking age. That's right. He doesn't drink. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he doesn't drink. <laughs> he will well, tonight. Yeah, he, will tonight. <laughs> he actually will tonight. We're taking him out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, not to get drunk or anything. Like no, no, no. That. We're taking him out. Just um, for his first legal. Opinion. Exactly. So we walked in the club today. I'm like, hey, we have a new adult, like full-fledged yeah. adult in the club. Kids are all yours. We'll be back at 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, really proud of this fantastic guy. Oh, he's awesome. He's awesome. Great seeing him growing up. Great seeing him uh, growing and developing every day. 100%. Come with, comes from a fantastic family. So. Um, nah, they're all right. Yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, all right. So what do you got for 10 minutes? All right. So we have it. Now, let's. Here's black the thing. Belt test. In our style, which is pretty big in Canada, we've had three black belt tests this year. That's right. And in each test, uh, I think we've had a total of nine people challenge the black belt test. I think it's been sets of, oh, wait, there have been um, 12 people have challenged the black belt test. Nine have failed. Whoa, okay, wow. We have a three have passed, nine have failed. And this has been held now on both the East and West Coast. And people going in their first, second, or third degree black belt. So it's a big deal. And um, we have one this weekend. There'll be Owen and I think three other people from different clubs are coming to, to challenge it. So what does a shodan mean? Mm. Right? Uh, well, show means beginning. Dan means level. You know, in Japan, you don't actually exist until you have your shodan. Yeah, you, you mentioned that. You yeah. know, like... Uh, That's when your karate training starts. Exactly. Yeah. When you... Uh, like Nick in our club, he's getting ready for his black belt test next year so he has his membership card from japan and it says rank and it's nothing mm. right because you're nothing because you're nothing right mm. um and then if you're black belt you get oh by the way i just got they got they hand out new cards the regular card is white i got a gold card why because you know go down oh okay <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know that I, was like, I got a new card um so the average person takes what would you think Three years, five years. Some people last a long time. To go from beginning to black belt? Yeah, like, yeah. Or, or what are you saying? To yeah, get your to showdown. Get your showdown. Well, I, uh, How long uh, did it take you? Well, I know you, I see your notes here, what you what you got, but it does depend sometimes on age, which is my scenario. Mm. We weren't allowed to challenge the showdown until we were 18. Okay. So okay. Old school. Old school. I started karate training when I was seven, so it took me 11 years yes. technically to get my showdown. Um so yeah, but uh, I mean, if I think about actual traditional karate training, how long maybe should it take? I think yeah, five to seven years. Mm. You can probably get from a white belt to a to a showdown. Yep, yep, exactly. And it depends on the curriculum they're looking for. Sure, of course. You know, it's both volume. Like some people in Japan can hit a showdown in a year, but they're going four nights a week. Sure. Right? Okay. Yeah. And I uh, mean, if karate is your life, and that's what you're doing. Exactly. Then I can see it. Yeah. Yep. Um, but one thing I wanted to say about showdown is. It's a marathon. Mm, it's a marathon. Especially a when you think about shodan to nidan. And people are like, well, what do you learn? Is like the curriculum different? You learn a few new things. Yeah. But what you're supposed to do also is perform what you've already learned better mm. and expand what you already know better. Sure. Right? So let's say you have all these katas that you've learned. Wado there'd be nine. I think in Shotokan, when you go for your shodan, you may know 16. Okay. How many katas? What was like a number you think you had to do for shituru? About Eight about eight about yeah. eight. I so think, not a yeah. lot. And Shitu has fifty. Yeah, right. Um, actually, there's not a lot of people in Shitu who know all fifty because it just takes too much to learn. It's too many of them. Um, yeah. So you have to, for your age and for your level and for your background, perform really, really well uh, to pass. You should look really rehearsed mm. and really sharp. Like people, if you get up and you look kind of like hesitant, it's not going to fly. You have to get up there and look rehearsed. Like it's. Okay, I've been doing this for a long time and practiced. practiced. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Um, But what's interesting is there's a lot of brown belts who go to classes, but not a lot of black belts. And uh, listening to other karate instructors, they're like, 
we have to make sure that we haven't created a sense of entitlement by wearing the black belt. Sure. Right? That, you know, you chain that rank, so, oh, okay, yeah, I don't have to keep, keep going. Mm. Right? And I think that's where the branding, you know, the popular culture branding has kind of fallen down on what a black belt really is. 100%. And it goes yeah. back to, like, your, your question at the beginning, like, what is a karateka, right? Um, I think when you get to be a black belt, that's really when you've got to dig deeper. That's when it's got to be like, oh, I got to do more, mm. right? Um, when you passed your black belt, did you feel like I could use every movement of the kata in any self-defense? Like, Absolutely not. Me too. Absolutely not. I was like, I just barely got them. I just barely, got, right? them. Yeah, I I just was, barely got them. I was. I struggled through my bunk guy. <laughs> <Okay, laughs> so. yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So I think that's another really cool thing is and we're going to do more of that in the club as we, as a, as our club matures more is we're going to do a lot more of the applications so that it's just flying and really, really uh, easy to go for. Sure. Now, I left a video on here. If you want to put it up in the link of the show notes, this is... Okay, you bring this up. Hidekazu Kanazawa. And he is one of the most famous karate performers and instructors in the world ever. He's a Shotokan um, instructor. And he created... Uh, he left the J Japan Karate Association, created his own association. And I want you to look at him performing. Now, he's got to be in his 40s or 50s. He's doing Heian Shodan. That's what it says here. And you just tell me what you see as, you, um, as he's performing here. Well, he, he performs for an hour and a half? No, no, I'm going to stop it after <laughs> the first kata. This is an old video. Oh, yeah. Digging the hair. Maybe seventies. Mm. So you can see longer stances. Very long. Yeah. Very big. Very big. Now, do you think a brown belt going for their black belt is going to be able to pull this off? A brown belt going for their black belt be able to pull this off? No. This, this is what. You know, and he's he's got to be in his forties, maybe early fifties. He's obviously. Very highly ranked at that moment. And it right? is sharp. It is very sharp. This is what you should look like. Yeah. You know what's really interesting is he doesn't look tense. No, no. He doesn't look tense, but he is, it's strong. Mm -hmm. Right? It looks strong, doesn't it? Yeah. So that was just the first you know, minute of this, you know, two it's, minutes, I guess. I'll just video. show you one more. So tell me what you think as you're looking at it. Yeah, very fast. Very polished. Definitely practiced, obviously. No extra movements. There's like no mm -hmm. no little extra movements in there. Obviously, his basics are, are, are strong. So Kanazawa Sensei is famous for having amazing technique. Yes, you know, okay. I think he won the first All Japan National Championships. Okay. Um, he now is a really big organizer. I think he may be in his 80s now. Mm. He's taller than me. Yeah. Um, he introduced Shotokan to England. Um, but I want to just show that, and you guys can look at the show notes. That, you know, obviously it's a high level black belt, but this is what it takes. Like you look at a brown belt who's going out to perform, they're still got a shake in their 100 percent. Right? It's like you, you, I remember uh the edge, the guitarist for U2. He's like, when you really care for a band, it hurts because they don't always play the greatest music or you have to dig and really listen to it. And karate is that kind of that same thing. You've got to just dig a little bit more. You kind of geek out about it. That's why Jesse Enkamp calls himself the, the karate, karate nerd. Yeah, the karate, karate nerd. nerd right? Yeah. So you got to really get into it. So when you're thinking about going for your black belt and what black belt means, I want you to think about that sort of stuff. There you go. Right on. All right, I love it. All right, let's move on to my fitness training tip of the week. And basically what I want to give you guys here this week is a sprint interval training that you can do that is specific for karate athletes. So when I talk about sprint training, this is when we're trying to build explosiveness and, and, and really that going from Point A to point B as fast as you can, but going 100% right from the beginning. So what you want to do is you want to find yourself, and this is specific to mostly kumite, not so much kata as kata is more longer and slow twitch. This is more fast twitch muscles getting and sprinting as fast as you can, like initiating movement in kumite. So what you want to do, you want to either 
get on a treadmill or find a hill that is about, I don't know, 12 to 15% grade uh, mm-hmm. incline. So you can either set that on a treadmill, which is a pretty decent uh, mm-hmm. hill. And you want to set a distance that you can cover in about 15 seconds. And the reason why you want to use 15 seconds is because you're never going to burst for 15 seconds in a karate match, but you might have a sequence that lasts 15 seconds, mm-hmm. not much longer than that before something would happen. So you, what you want to do is you want to go from a point A to point B, 15 seconds, as hard as you can. You want it to be uphill so that your muscles are actually working harder than usual. Sprint as fast as you can. And then you're going to rest for 45 seconds. So you're going to go for for 15 seconds, rest for 45. And the reason why we do that kind of one to three work to rest ratio is because that's what we're finding is kind of typical in a karate match. Mm -hmm. In a karate kumite match, most of it is just, especially at the higher level, bouncing around and moving and setting up your opponent. Only about a third to a quarter of it is actually attacking and, and, and initiating mm-hmm. techniques. Would you agree with that? Totally. Yeah. So this one to three work to rest ratio, 15 seconds on, 45 seconds off is kind of what you want to work for for a kumite match. Did you run steps? Like when they go to like a... Yeah, you could do 100%. You could do um, uh, stairs, stairs yeah. or, 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 or whatever, stairs, anything that's kind of uphill. You want it to be uphill because you want it, again, to be harder than it would actually be in a karate mm-hmm. match and work your muscles a little bit more. That way when you get in there, it's no problem, right? But the 15 seconds on, 45 seconds off is a perfect interval um, time. And you want to do that for probably about 10 minutes, probably about 10 minutes or so. Funny you say that. Like, the first time I ever heard that was when um, Toki Hill, who was the head coach for US in 96, 97, came to BC and he did a, a seminar when he had just come from Lake Placid, the US Olympic Training Center. Sure, sure. And he said, all right, what we got to do is we got to go for like, 15 seconds. He's like one to four, one to three work ratios. Yeah. And so he had a skipping. So we was the first time I ever did hurdles for as a karate athlete was with him. So he brought a huge bag of hurdles. Okay. I remember picking him up at the airport at like 2 a.m. in the morning. It was with like a massive service. bag of hurdles. <laughs> yeah. So he had us doing skipping, hurdles. You know the aerobic bench? The old aerobic bench? Like it was like a bench and then you put the little things in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The aerobic the, step. Like the, yeah, 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 yeah. The risers. So yeah, the yeah. risers and stuff. So he had us doing that. But again, it was like, you know, 15 on, 45 off. Sure. But then he said he, he was trying to get us to one and one He said, by just before the tournament, you're going to do one and one But for a really short amount of time. Yes. Now, again, this is the first round of hearing and learning about how to use it. Yeah. Yep. So it's a little bit different the way you would, you would do it now. Yes. But... Um, yeah, no, that's great. I mean, interval training has been around for a while. There's obviously different types of interval training. Mm-hmm. What I like about sprint training is that anybody can do it if they can walk or run, and you don't need any extra equipment. You can literally go find a hill that's about a 12 to 15% yes, yes. incline and just start running up and down. Now, I heard in sprint training that it's the first four steps are the most important. 100%. And that's why you really want to emphasize like the, the, the exploding right out of the, the gate. Hit to the ground, right? Yeah. And actually, what I re- recommend too is getting into a, your fighting stance, getting into your kumite stance, and then exploding again, trying to get 100% of that fast twitch muscle right away and sprinting up as, as, as fast as you can up that hill. Um, sprints, because it now, you know, you see people with like cords and bands as they're trying to sprint and go and cross. Yep. Is it that still effective because it's making it harder or is it start Yeah, that's just a different way of doing it. it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You could do that in, in a dojo for sure with yep. have somebody hold a band behind it to increase the resistance a little bit on that just as well. if you don't have a hill. Yeah, if you don't yeah. have a hill. Yeah, you, you could absolutely do that. Of course, then you need a partner. I was trying to think of something maybe you could just do on your own type thing. But yeah, for sure. Any type of band, any type of thing to add resistance. Those Those steps are good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anything that adds more resistance than what is usually on the body. Awesome. Sprint training. There you go. Love it. I do like it. And it's good for everybody. I mean, 100%. I remember uh, when um, the Born Identity movies were coming out and uh, Matt Damon was doing them and he was giving an interview and he was like, okay, I'm like 38 years old and I have to sprint. And I've never sprinted in my whole <laughs> life and it's such a different type of fitness. 100%. And he's like, now nah, I'm totally addicted like to sprinting. Yeah, it's great. It's great. Um, and then when I was training for the Masters Championships in Japan, I did a lot of beach sprinting. Yes, beach sprinting is oh, really good. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, of course, because the sand makes it unstable so um, you don't get as much push-off so your muscles really have to work. Yeah. And yeah, so it's good. 
All right. right. That's my fitness training tip of the week. That's awesome. All right. Just about wrapping up this episode here. We got a couple upcoming tournaments. You know, not really upcoming anytime too soon. But uh, what do we got? Coming up the 19th. Now we're going to skip that one. The next K1 isn't until the Premier League in Berlin, which is until September. Our styles, all nations. Yeah. uh, I think it's August 23rd to 26th. In Leicester, England. And the PKF Karate Federation, their Cadet Junior and U21 Championships in Brazil is August 22nd to 25th. So we will keep an eye on that one because that will be a big tournament as well. There will be a very large group of people from Canada and the U.S. going to that. Yeah, so there we go. That's what's coming up tap here from the karate world. And, of course, from us. Every Monday morning, we'll be coming out with these podcasts. These are great podcasts. It's great. We're banging them out and uh, having a good time for sure. Are you going to be updating your KFIT one? That podcast. Like in September or Yeah, October I was thinking about it. I, I still want to get in on there. I was telling you before that I want to change the format a, a little bit, and I'm still playing around with how to do it. I also have some interviews lined up that I kind of want to work out, but I definitely do want to get it get it out there for sure. That's awesome. So, so one thing I'm going to do in my vlogs is I'm going to get to the point where the vlog audio becomes the podcast. Okay. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to somehow figure that out. So I'm not double broadcasting. Okay. Or, but uh, I'm going to work on that. Okay. We get almost there. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Okay. I think you can. There's absolutely an easy way to do it. Anyway, we'll, we'll figure that out. Well, we got it going. We got it going. <laughs> all right, guys. Well, anyways, again, send all your questions, comments, karate360podcast.com or karate360podcast on Facebook. Check I'm, out Kaelin Anglos on everything. And check out Richard Mosdell. That's me. On everything, especially on the YouTube. All right. On the YouTube. On, the YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> on the YouTube. <laughs> I'm Kaelin Anglos. I'm Richard Mosdell. And we'll talk to you guys next week. San Rokumaru. Bye.